my name is Mara Bollard and I am a lecturer and the assistant director of the Weinberg Institute. Uh, I have a background in moral philosophy uh, and uh, I'm interested in questions at the intersection of moral philosophy and cognitive science. Uh, so especially questions to do with the emotions and emotions that people tend to call moral. And I'm Rick Lewis. I'm faculty in psychology and linguistics and the current director of the Weinberg Institute. Uh, I have a background in computer science, even though I'm in the psychology department. So I'm what you might call a computational cognitive scientist, interested in lots of topics ranging from language processing to decision making. Uh, I would say uh, that cognitive science is the interdisciplinary study of the mind and the brain. Although I, I have to say, I think if you, you know, if you asked five cognitive scientists what is cognitive science, you'll get ten different answers. Um, so let me give you <laughs> not just five, but ten. <laughs> yeah, let, let me give you two more. Um, in addition to uh, interdisciplinary study of mind and brain, um, so I think a, a second answer that. Uh, is, is one way to think about how cognitive science is distinct, is its emphasis on finding explanations and building theories of internal mental processes, um, as opposed to uh, describing or explaining behavior. So that focus on the internal, I think, is a, is a kind of distinctive focus of cognitive science. Uh, and a third way to think about it, which is in a way, uh, my favorite new way of thinking about it, although it's an old way, is that cognitive science is the science of minds in the plural. Um, so this is a recognition that human minds are one kind of mind, certainly one kind of brain in the biological world, but more generally one, one kind of mind in a whole space of maybe kinds of computational minds uh, that would include minds that were now uh, trying to construct and engineer an artificial intelligence. So that's kind of a, what I might call a pluralist view of cognitive science, science of the minds in the plural. As, as I mentioned in my previous answer, cog, cognitive science really is the, uh, an interdisciplinary field. Uh, so uh, the fields that make up cognitive science include psychology, neuroscience, philosophy, computer science, and linguistics. Uh, and so uh, we also see methods and ideas drawn from all of those fields uh, in tackling all of these really cool questions about, about minds and brains. Right, and, and those fields that Mara just mentioned are, are kind of the usual suspects that come up in, in cognitive science, but uh, it also draws on ideas from ethology, uh, there's contact with anthropology, economics. Um, and one way I like to think about this is that the problem of understanding the human mind and minds in general is just, it turns out to be too big uh, in some ways for one field to have all of the ideas and methods. So uh, just to have the, the kind of freedom to draw on methods and ideas from any field as they're needed is part of what makes cognitive science really cool scientifically. Lots of questions as you can imagine because the topic is so big. Um, but I'll just give a couple of examples that I think illustrate uh, the way in which cognitive science, I think, is particularly good at asking why questions. Um, so uh, one fundamental question in linguistics and understanding human language uh, is, well, a conventional approach is to understand the structure of human language uh, and there are whole fields in linguistics devoted to sound and meaning and syntax and so forth and those are deep fields uh, uh, that you know go back decades um, but in each one of these fields and more generally in in uh, the cognitive science of language uh, you know as a, as a uh, as a whole there's a deep question about why language has the properties that it does. So why does, why do we have words? Why are there nouns and verbs? 
why, why do sentences have the, the kind of structure that they do and not other kinds of structures that we could imagine that they do have? And those, those are really deep why questions that I think cognitive science is good at asking and sometimes good at answering, uh, maybe better at asking than answering. Uh, but these kinds of why questions show up you know, in, in all kinds of domains. Decision making is another good example. So uh, we know from work uh, of behavioral economists, uh, for example, and decision making researchers that human decision making doesn't always seem to conform to what we might call norms of rational uh, decisions or rational choice. And we can document those and categorize them and study them empirically. And, and there's a whole zoo of uh, effects uh, that have all kinds of different names. But then we can step back and ask, why? Why do we have uh, decision-making systems in our heads that exhibit these kinds of uh, phenomena? And those are, those are really deep, deep questions that I think cognitive science is good at asking and sometimes making a little bit of progress on answering. Yeah, uh, I, I think all of that is, is absolutely right. I think um, another way of answering the question, I think there are lots of things we could say. Uh, we could point to uh, just the diversity of topics that cognitive scientists try to tackle. Uh, so examining our language capabilities and processes looking at things like visual perception, looking at, as Rick mentioned, the ways that we make decisions, um, lots and lots of different areas uh, of study. But I think another way of thinking about the kinds of questions that cognitive scientists ask are questions that lend themselves to answers at multiple yet integrated levels of explanation. So these why questions that, that Rick is highlighting, they really can be made sense of at this functional level. So what is the problem that our mind is trying to solve? Uh, whether it be constructing a perceptual reality for us or mapping sounds to meanings like we're doing in language. Um, but in order to, to give um, an, a, a holistic kind of answer to that question, we might also want to ask about what's going on in the head computationally. And then we might also want to know about what's happening at that neural or that physical level in the brain. Let me uh, give you two examples that are that are quite different. Um, and one I'll motivate by uh, appealing to, I think, an experience that many of us are having over and over again as we're stuck in Zoom meetings. How many times have you heard uh, the phrase oh, you're, uh, you're muted, or I can't find the raise hand button, or wait a minute, how do I share a screen? Uh, and you might think, why can't people learn how to use Zoom? But maybe that's the wrong question to be asking. The, I think the right question to be asking is, why isn't Zoom designed with the user interface that is adapted to the human mind in ways that let it be used more effectively? And that's, these are questions that uh, a huge field called human computer interaction addresses. And it really is a kind of applied cognitive science. Uh, it's a, it's a, you know, and it's, a, it's an engineering discipline in a way. Uh, the application of what we know about how people uh, perceive and interact with devices like computers ought to be used to make them better. So that's one kind of application. Another very different uh, application is just emerging in the last few years and it's a it's very exciting and it's a new field basically called computational psychiatry and it's maybe not what you think computational psychiatry would be so it's not about producing uh, artificial AI uh, psychiatrists okay we're not quite there yet um, but instead what it is is uh, an application of cognitive science that uses theoretical models, usually computational models, of how cognition, thought, planning, cognitive control, memory works, and then using those models to understand individual differences in cognition. Uh, a wide span of individual differences that would include what we think of as uh, 
pathological types of cognition that need to be addressed. Um, and so this is pretty exciting because it's the first time that uh, computational models of cognition have been really used in, in that way. So those are two really awesome examples and I'll just add one more. Um, so uh, I would say another example of applied cognitive science is this growing field uh, of, or the growing study of autonomous vehicles. Um, so this really relies on work from moral philosophy about what it is to make moral decisions. So suppose an autonomous vehicle is faced with essentially the dilemma of whether to uh, avoid some kind of collision. If that dilemma requires making a choice between say crashing the vehicle and endangering the, the, the passenger in that car or avoiding hitting pedestrians, exactly how those vehicles are going to be programmed relies on input from philosophy in figuring out what's moral as well as studies of decision making and how those decision making procedures can be implemented and uh, and engineered in these new kinds of of, of machines uh, so uh, i've come to cognitive science from uh, a much more theoretical background uh, given that my uh, doctoral work was in moral philosophy primarily. Um, I do have a background in uh, psychology as well, but the kind of work that I do, while it draws really heavily on empirical results from, uh, especially from within psychology, uh, I don't myself do empirical work. Uh, so my work is an example of uh, how philosophy is contributing to cognitive scientific study of mental states like emotion. Uh, but from a more conceptual uh, or theoretical standpoint. Uh, so that's one, that's one thing I would say. I would also say that uh, I came to a place like Michigan uh, that has uh, an incredible interdisciplinary approach to all kinds of questions. Uh, and uh, it put me in fortuitous contact with cognitive scientists like Rick. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to, uh, to end up back at Michigan at the Weinberg Institute. So I became a, a cognitive scientist through computer science, it turns out. Uh, so I became interested in programming and computer science at a pretty young age. And then as an undergraduate, I really became interested in artificial intelligence. And at the time, I thought that was how uh, you could work on understanding how the human mind worked. In fact, that's what really started to, uh, you know, grab my attention was that question, how, how does the mind work? And at the time, I really didn't even know that uh, the artificial intelligence as a field is not directly working on that problem. It's working on, uh, you know, the engineering problem of building intelligent artifacts. Uh, but I thought it was basically working on the problem of how the mind works, and they're very closely related, of course. So I, I went uh, down the path of pursuing a PhD in computer science, uh, working in, uh, in artificial intelligence, but really the whole time working in cognitive science because my advisor was a cognitive scientist, and I became interested in uh, human language processing and psycholinguistics as a computer science PhD student. And I was uh, happily, I was in a program that let me do that. And uh, then a few decades later, here I am in a psychology department and a cognitive science institute. Cognitive science students uh, hopefully will come away with uh, deeper expertise and knowledge and appreciation uh, of multiple disciplines uh, and the ways in which that really enriches uh, and informs the study uh, of minds. Uh, so the hope is that students who perhaps didn't understand how maybe philosophy could shed light on some of these really deep, important questions will come away with a greater appreciation for that, coupled with, say, the really important programming skills they gained by taking courses uh, in computer science, coupled with, of course, the uh, really important things that they've learned from their cognitive psychology courses. Um, I think that's one thing that we really hope that, that our students will take away from the major. What Mara said. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, one, one way I like to, to say this is that I think our students end up being 
intellectual bilinguals and trilinguals and sometimes quadlinguals, if that's a word. Uh, and, you know, really become skilled at shifting perspectives. And I, I think, um, you know, whether uh, our students go out into the business world, government, nonprofit, science, academia, uh, the problems that they're going to work on will require multiple perspectives. And so being able to uh, put on different hats and look at things in different ways, which they're forced to uh, just in their, uh, you know, day-to-day, week-to-week academic schedule, I think that's really valuable. This class is a large introductory class. It's offered every regular semester, fall and winter term. Um, Like I said, it's introductory, so there are no prerequisites for the class. Uh, It provides an overview of the four main subtracts that students can go on and focus on if they major in cognitive science. COXI 200 is a gateway to the cognitive science major. Uh, In fact, students can't actually declare a major in cognitive science until they've passed the drop-add deadline in the semester that they're taking the class. Um, COGSI 200 specifically is a prereq to the major, so it doesn't count as one of the nine classes that students need to take to major in cognitive science. Cognitive science major is comprised of four tracks, computation and cognition, decision and cognition, language and cognition, and finally, philosophy and cognition. Each track consists of a total of nine courses. There are three core courses and six elective courses. Four of the elective courses must be chosen from a track specific list. The remaining two electives can come from any of the cognitive science tracks. As an interdisciplinary major, we require that at least one of your cognitive science electives comes from a department that's different than the two departments that make up your cognitive science required courses. For example, if you're a computation track student, your cognitive science requirements come from psychology and computer science. So at least one of your cognitive science electives should come from a department that's not psychology or computer science, such as linguistics or philosophy. Cross-listed courses can count towards this requirement. So if you're a computation track student and you take an an elective that is cross-listed between psychology and linguistics, that would fulfill this requirement. Although we already have a wide variety of courses here at the Weinberg Institute, you might have found another class that you wish to count towards your COGSI curriculum. If this is the case, you may submit a course petition. We evaluate course petitions to see if a class has 50% or more COGSI content and then determine which track the course belongs on. It's very important that you submit a syllabus as part of your course petition. Without a syllabus, we are unlikely to be able to approve your class. If you want to learn more about independent study and research opportunities, click here to learn more.